this is the story of two of the world's favorite drinks, both with one aim, global domination. Coke and Pepsi conquered the world. I mean, there is no greater symbol of globalization than those two fizzy drinks companies. On board will be two specially designed soft drink cans, one from Coke, the other from Pepsi. 130 years of feuds and fierce competition. I think that Pepsi challenge just got in their head. They got thinking that consumers want sweet. We've got to be sweet. And they panicked. They blinked. But which one is your favorite? In the red corner, it's the billion dollar beverage that is Coca Cola. Coca Cola is now going to be even better. And in the blue corner, nipping at the heels of the leader, it's the younger upstart, Pepsi. Pepsi is the cola to beat. So take your seat ringside and get ready for a fight with added fizz. As a product, it's just fizzy brown water. As Coke and Pepsi battle it out to be crowned king of the colas. You're not just buying a fizzy drink, you're buying a brand and a whole lifestyle that comes with it. Over 40 years ago, Pepsi did something that took the world by storm. They introduced the Pepsi Challenge. Okay, now I want you to tell me which one you chose. Pepsi Cola. <laughs> And in summer 2019, they did it all over again. We went all in with the ultimate blind taste test against the nation's biggest selling cola. And we won. The premise is simple. Take a sip and decide your favorite. It was this challenge that in the 1970s saw people in their thousands choose Pepsi over Coke. It was a gutsy move, as it was all about the taste and not about the brand. But what exactly is in the mysterious brown liquid? Coca-Cola or Pepsi Bar. 99.5% water and sucrose. The really cool part is when you get to 0.5%, the very last little bit, which is a whole mishmash of very interesting chemicals. Both Coca-Cola and Pepsi are fairly heavy on the citrus flavors. So we're going to go with orange first. The highly guarded and very secret recipes of both Coke and Pepsi contain small concentrations of lemon oil, nutmeg, coriander and cinnamon oil. You don't want to go overboard with this, otherwise your Coke tastes like Christmas. So now we're going to kick off with the Pepsi flavouring. All of the essential oils are the same, with the exception of one. Um, and that one is this neroli, which is based on essentially a flower. And what they replaced it with instead is this thing called Petit Gras. Which is a citrus-flavoured essential oil derived from the bitter orange tree. This is the main difference between this and Coca-Cola. This may well be the reason that Pepsi has that more lemony taste. The original Coke recipe also contained cocaine, and one other subtle difference in the flavour combinations is the addition of cocoa leaf and vanilla. What we're going to do is mix that up now. The individual flavour concentrations are added to the sugar syrup along with citric acid. It's kind of the magic moment. And black caramel to give it its distinctive colour. So that's the Pepsi syrup finished. And when we compare it to the Coke, they look very, very similar indeed. So what we need to do now is we need to add carbonated water and uh, then you'll have your drink. It's kind of the moment of truth when I actually get to try these things, so I'm kind of excited. So that's interesting. It's got a lot of that caramel flavour going, um, quite a strong caramel taste, even though it's not as strong a stronger colour as modern Coke. I'm definitely getting sort of the vanilla-y taste and the cinnamon in there. I guess the proof's in the pudding with the Pepsi, so let's give this a go. Ooh, it's not as complicated, um, and I guess there's a simpler recipe, so that would make sense. The taste is a lot more cleaner, I suppose. I think I prefer the Coca-Cola. <laughs> Remember, when you are buying a can of Coca-Cola, 
only a few pence of that is the fizzy liquid inside. Most of it is the brand you're buying. Now, to this day, Coca-Cola spends $6 billion a year advertising its products. It's worth remembering that a lot of the genius moves, particularly the marketing moves by Coca-Cola and by Pepsi, involved tons of money being thrown at the problem. Pepsi spends over $5.8 billion themselves in advertising. This is no small battle. This is the Cola Wars, and it has been going on for over 130 years. North Carolina, 1898. Innovative pharmacist Caleb Bradham had invented a brown sugary drink that he hoped would make him a fortune. Pepsi starts out as nothing more than a another imitator of Coca-Cola, and there are tons of imitators of Coca-Cola. And there were lots of these kind of cola-like drinks doing the rounds in these drugstores, promising absolutely everything, whether it's headaches or digestive problems. So Pepsi, you know, that's named after dyspepsia, indigestion. After trademarking the name Pepsi Cola, they were out of the traps and on their way up. But hard times arrived at Pepsi Cola's door during World War I. The high sugar price and severe rationing of it saw them eventually go bankrupt. Coke, the brand leader, was invented 12 years earlier by another pharmacist, John Pemberton, and was receiving massive success. The recipe was cocaine, caffeine, and sugar. You know, the big three things that really gave you a jolt of energy. And that was a product that people really, people really liked. <laughs> Coca-Cola passed through the hands of several buyers, eventually being bought by an American business tycoon. Asa Candler acquired the company in 1891, and in the early days, one of his main objectives was to put their logo on almost everything. It didn't matter any type of advertising they would engage in. Asa Candler saw the future um, by using not just a little advertising, but mass advertising. You know, he poured, you know, in 1902, I think, over $100,000 in advertising, which is huge. It's enormous. It was all very well throwing money into advertising, but Asa Candler wanted to make sure Coke was available to buy nationwide. What Coca-Cola did really smartly was it developed a franchise system in which it sold this cola syrup to bottlers all around the US. This was really revolutionary for its time, um, so it quickly gained nationwide listings. It was unusual to have a drink that you could find around the entire US, and it looked the same, and it looked premium, it looked quality and that was something they really stood out on. Many other copycat cola businesses had tried and failed. One by one, Coke beat its imitators. Africola, Americola, Alicola, Bolamicola, Cafe de Ola, Carbocola, Candycola, Capicola, Cherocola, and I'm just through the seas so far. It was an endless stream of imitators. And everyone had, you know, different bottles and they were trying to look like Coke. Two bottles of Coca-Cola. Yeah. Make sure it's Coca-Cola. All them bottles look pretty much alike. With Pepsi being bankrupt, Coke didn't see them as a threat. It would prove to be a huge mistake. In 1931, after passing through the hands of several investors, Pepsi Cola was finally bought by ambitious businessman Charles Guth. Pepsi was bought out of bankruptcy in the 30s uh, by a fellow who ran uh, uh, soda fountains in, in New York and wanted to compete with Coke because they wouldn't give him a discount on syrup. Pepsi's moment in the sun comes in the 1930s. Following the Wall Street crash and the Great Depression, people are on their uppers. They are looking at ways to save money. And Coca-Cola's not that cheap. A little small bottle costs a nickel, five cents. And Pepsi-Cola realized this was their opportunity. What they would do 
is that they would offer cola at great value. So Pepsi offers double the amount for your nickel. Pepsi's radio jingle, Nickel Nickel, became the first radio advertisement to be broadcast coast to coast. Pepsi Cola, it's a spot, 12 ounces, that's a lot, twice as much for a nickel too. Eventually, it would be recorded in 55 languages and named one of the most effective ads of the 20th century. Coca-Cola had a real dilemma when Pepsi-Cola came out with this 12-ounce bottle and promoted it with their jingle twice as much as a nickel, too. Consumers were drinking it up all over the place. What was Coca-Cola going to do? The gauntlet had been thrown down. Pepsi were back and they were fighting. Coca-Cola weren't going to take this lying down. The cola wars had begun. Pepsi was getting real and they took it to our streets with the Pepsi challenge. Hidden away in the northwest of England is a Coca-Cola factory. You usually get here for seven o'clock play test. It's a very fast-paced um, play, so this is probably the calmest point of the day. Operations director Alison Rands has given us an all-access pass to their Wakefield factory. Do you usually let people film the play? Uh, no, we certainly don't. It's very, very rare to let a film crew into uh, Coca-Cola Wakefield. Why is that? Because it's, uh, there's some elements that are close to guarded secrets. Why are they so secretive? Well, I suppose mainly because of the secret formula. How they make Coca-Cola, what exactly is in that recipe? I suppose Coca-Cola is simply the Willy Wonka of soft drinks. to the biggest soft drinks facility in Europe. The Wakefield factory was established in 1989 and is the largest soft drinks plant by volume in Europe. They have nine manufacturing lines that produce in excess of 100 million cases every year. And that's just this factory alone. Got just short of 500 people on a 24 7 shift pattern. We run 364 days of the year. The can lines will be able to produce 6,000 cans per minute. Our bottle lines will do 2,000 a minute. So, a total of about 8,000 cans or bottles per minute every single minute, every day of the week to make sure we can make a billion litres of uh, product a year. Sorry, how much? A billion, a billion litres of product a year. It takes a bit of getting your head around that. So what's the secret to making this incredibly successful product? So this is the syrup room. Today we're just prepping some Diet Coke. It's a 38,000 litre syrup prep. That syrup prep will last us approximately four hours. The concentrate, the water and the sweeteners all get mixed together and blended. If we were making coke, we'd have similar concentrate with the secret recipe in it. We'd then pipe in liquid sugar from our sugar dissolving plant and water, make up the syrup in the same fashion. A mix solution is then piped onto the production line, carbonated and dispensed into pre-made cans and bottles at astonishing speed. And then we close the uh, container. So that's either with a seam lid uh, for a can or a cap on top of a bottle. All of the massive amount of product that's made is stored in a huge warehouse. So these yellow things that you can see here are the cranes, each named after one of the engineer's family members. Louise is my uh, very dear wife. Do you have any major breakdowns of Louise? Yes, we have. Yeah? Louise has let me down a few times. <laughs> We have 28,000 pallets that are stored in here. 
one of our customers will, will make an order. The haulier then gets the information that says that Morrison's Wakefield need this load for 1800 on Wednesday. So my team will press some, a series of buttons and then it will send instruction to the cranes um, to go to a location and to pull a crane to a drop-off point. And it will travel along the hard link through these doors into a location where a forklift will pick it up and load it onto a vehicle, which will then be collected by a haulier and dispatched for our gatehouse. The Wakefield plant is one of the most sophisticated in the world. But of course, when Coke was still in its infancy, getting its product to the customer wasn't that easy. As the 1940s dawned, the world was at war and America's biggest soft drink giants had already been fighting it out for decades. In support of the war effort, Pepsi changed their branding to a patriotic red, white and blue, with their logo appearing on all their bottle tops. Coke also had something up their sleeves to make sure they were still at the forefront of everyone's minds. Coca-Cola turns around to the government and says, you can't ration us because we are a key item for the American fighting man. We can't be rationed in the same way you can't ration bullets and fuel and, and, and meat for the soldiers. This is necessary and they won the argument. So Coca-Cola was not rationed. It was distributed all around the world to American servicemen. But physically getting Coke to the troops was proving problematic. Now, it's very difficult to ship Coca-Cola, fizzy drink, across the Atlantic when you've got the U-boats trying to bomb any boat crossing the Atlantic. Future President Dwight D. Eisenhower came up with the perfect solution. So Eisenhower says, well, come and build a bottling plant. So Coca-Cola builds a bottling plant behind the front lines in North Africa so that the American troops have a steady supply of Coca-Cola. No one thinks this is weird. They think, of course, because Coca-Cola is just as important as ammunition and fuel. Despite protests from Pepsi and accusations of the army creating a cola monopoly, the bottling plants went ahead. And of course, for the rest of the war, Coca-Cola is associated with the American liberation of various different countries. For Europeans who haven't had sugar for years and years because of rationing, it's very exciting and it is indelibly linked with that idea of liberation, with cool Americans, with democracy, with freedom. And it, you know, that, if anything, is the foundation stone of the myth that Coca-Cola is America. During the war, American servicemen consumed 10 billion bottles of Coca-Cola. Coke's support of the war effort was more than racking up sales. It was the single greatest marketing coup in the company's history. Coke became an icon that took on a life of its own. Post-war left Pepsi trailing. They had nothing to lose, so they just had to innovate. They trialed selling Pepsi in steel cans instead of glass bottles. They were also experimenting with a host of different, yet catchy slogans. And with the dawning of the age of television, the first Pepsi advert featuring a young James Dean's first TV appearance hit the screens. More bounce to the ounce, more bounce to the ounce. <laughs> buy Pepsi, buy the carton. the smaller brand, Pepsi had to be much more nimble and make risky decisions to keep growing the business. Pepsi was the first um, in the late 60s to really see these baby boomers born after the Second World War, you know, and focus on youth in its advertising. That was Pepsi. Pepsi are going hard for the youth market. They have got cool teenagers drink Pepsi, their fuddy-duddy parents drink Coca-Cola. Pepsi were about to coin a phrase that would stay with them forever, the Pepsi generation. Suddenly, they, they discovered advertising in a far sexier way than Coca-Cola. These adverts specifically targeted the youth, tapping into a previously neglected market, and it had caught Coke off guard. Coke had to strike back hard. What they came up with was groundbreaking and memorable. 
I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow white turtle doves. Like Hilltop is one of the most famous ads of all time. It simply involves a huge cast of young people from all over the world, often kind of in their national costumes, assembled on a hilltop in Italy, united by a bottle of Coca-Cola. The song became a, a cultural phenomenon. I mean, people wanted to hear a song from a commercial. That doesn't happen very much. And they reinforced the original Coca-Cola is the real thing is what's going to bring us together. It's the real thing. It's so saccharine. I mean, it's teach the world how to sing with honeybees and apple trees. I mean, it's, it's awful, but it worked. It really worked. It tapped into a latent desire, particularly from Americans, that, that we could find world peace thanks to Coca-Cola. <laughs>Whilst Coca-Cola was delivering us ads which were glossy, full of glamour, Pepsi was getting real and they took it to our streets with the Pepsi Challenge. You're about to take the Pepsi Challenge. You know, I have two bottles of cola back here and you don't know which is which. No, I don't. We have never met before. That's correct. Right. Okay. Except at my sister's wedding. <laughs> but beside that, we have never met. Well, the Pepsi challenge is fascinating. Basically, the Pepsi uh, company decided to do taste tests in markets around the country and, and advertise the findings. This is the taste. This is the test. Pepsi versus Coke, the Pepsi challenge. Pepsi. And all across America, more people pick Pepsi, Pepsi. time Pepsi. after time after time. Pepsi Cola. Oh, what a time. This campaign was so innovative it stripped away 90 years of brand loyalty and took it back to the product. This was actually a really bold step from Pepsi because what it was saying is we're setting the tone of the conversation. Which do you prefer? I like you. Tell me what you picked. I like Pepsi. Now I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm drinking Coke all the time. Well, Pepsi tastes pretty good. <laughs> Well, so it turns out a slight number more people like the sweeter taste of Pepsi on a first sip. So what was it that made people choose Pepsi? Rather than clever marketing, could there be a different explanation? The human tongue can detect four basic flavors, salt, sour, bitter, and sweet. Humans are naturally pre-programmed to be drawn to sweet. So if Pepsi is slightly sweeter, it gets the edge. So what we got here is a very diluted Coca-Cola. This is literally some Coca-Cola with water and the same amount of Pepsi with the same amount of water. And this chemical here is something called DNSA um, and it's a test that we use to show essentially how much sugar is in stuff. What we're going to do is add the same amount of this to both and we're going to leave that for about 10 minutes and then we should see a colour change. So we're starting off with this very yellowy orange colour. The samples are placed into a water bath for 10 minutes. So what we see when we look very, very closely is that the Pepsi, this one here, is a darker colour than the Coca-Cola. Now the difference is small, and we know that's the case because there is very little difference in the sugar content, but 
this would lend credit to the fact that Pepsi has more sugar, and that might well be a factor when we consider the Pepsi challenge. So it's a brilliant piece of marketing because it takes the most important attribute in the category, which is taste, and it presents a scientific test that shows Pepsi coming out on top every single time. So that's fantastic for Pepsi. All across this country, people took the Pepsi challenge, and Pepsi won because... You know a winner when you taste one. Even though the difference was minimal, it was enough to tip the taste scales in Pepsi's favor. Ads like this made it exciting. It was brave, it was bold, and some would say reckless. But it paid off and brought millions of new followers to Pepsi, elevating it to a whole new level. But it was quite a risky move by Pepsi because Coke's the market leader, and you would presume by definition that more people would prefer Coke, but they didn't. Coca-Cola would be shaken enough to question its entire product. And it caused immense consternation back in headquarters in Atlanta because it was a direct challenge to the quality of the product. The cola wars have been raging for the last 130 years. The battle between Coke and Pepsi is a real heavyweight one, slugging it out, ducking and diving now for decades. But it's been hard for Pepsi, who are considered the underdog of this double act. One of the perennial problems that Pepsi faces is that it can be seen as a second best option. So sometimes we see it as something we don't ask for, but we're just given uh, when there's no Coca-Cola available, and perhaps with an apology at the same time. So throughout their advertising history, Pepsi has tried to address that. What do you have, folks? A large pepperoni pizza. No Pepsi, please. In the no 90s, they did that with an angelic little girl. She's given a Coke, and then she's transformed into this somewhat scary mafioso boss who makes it very clear that she really, really, really does want a Pepsi. Hey, come here. I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm going to tell you. We both know I ordered a Pepsi Cola, and now you've insulted me and my entire family by offering me this. They're a little bit more of a cheeky upstart, so they like to use that to lighten the mood, whereas a lot of Coke's best advertising has been perhaps more soulful um, and traditional and heartwarming in its tone of voice. <laughs> It wasn't just little girls on the payroll. To capture our attention and grab sales from Coke, Pepsi drafted in some of the biggest names in pop. Like this ad, featuring David Bowie and Tina Turner. And it really takes off in the 1980s, when it hires at the most outrageous sum of money, $5 million, the services of Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson's involvement positioned Pepsi as the cola for the new generation, and a big budget ad was commissioned. The story goes, he's shown the storyboard of the advert, and he goes, um, I don't like the advert. <laughs> you show my face too much. He's like, what? We've spent $5 million hiring the services of Michael Jackson, and he's turning around saying, he doesn't want his face involved in the advert. This is an absolute disaster. But actually, it is supposedly Michael Jackson himself who comes up with the idea that don't show my face at the start. Show the little symbols of Michael Jackson, my silvery glove, my hat, my dance moves, and only at the end do I turn around and you see my face. You're the best generation because I'm down and it's the thrill of the day. Ultimately, Pepsi is associated with youth, and with pop culture in a way that Coke can't quite match. But sometimes these celebrity endorsements don't always work. And in 2017, a Pepsi ad made headlines for all the wrong reasons. But the love was done. Yeah, not on my watch. The Kendall Jenner commercial was a rare mistake in the Pepsi advertising story. But this one went disastrously wrong because they forgot to take into account the context. We are the lions, we are the chosen, we got the shot. This well-intended ad resulted in a massive negative backlash. We are the lions. The advert sees Kendall whipping off a disguise and joining a crowd of protesters. She later offers a policeman a Pepsi, which brings the crowd to cheers. 
People were angry as they felt like Pepsi were being exploitative and undermining the protests of the Black Lives Matter movement happening in America at the time the ad was launched. It also didn't look at religious sensitivities. You can see that there's um, Muslim women in there wearing the hijab and, and they're hugging males and that could lead to a backlash too. The online reaction was huge. The hashtag Boycott Pepsi was trending worldwide and people in their droves were telling others not to buy any of their products until the ad was pulled. On the surface, the intentions were good, so it was a desire to show that the world is divided and wouldn't it all be better if we came together and celebrate the things that we have in common? So, in a funny way, it's not that different from the Coca-Cola ad set on a mountaintop in the 1970s that we all celebrate as a masterpiece of marketing. Pepsi apologised and withdrew the ad, but nevertheless, it was still a huge marketing disaster for them. But even when it comes to marketing disasters, Coke comes out on top. Back in the 80s, it suffered a massive marketing fail, triggered by the original Pepsi challenge. They were obsessed with the taste test. They got thinking that consumers want sweet. We've got to be sweet. And they panicked. They blinked. Uh, and that's where new Coke came in. On April 23rd, 1985, Coca-Cola did the unthinkable. The best soft drink, Coca-Cola, is now going to be even better. Simply stated, we have a new formula for Coke. They have done tens of thousands of blind taste testings, and people say, yes, they prefer new Coke versus original Coke. And the bosses of Coca-Cola are super confident that this is a better drink. Changing the closely guarded secret formula of Coke's recipe was arguably the single biggest revolution in the company's history. Well, New Coke is just fascinating to me. I mean, it, it is, it's an instance in which, in which the Coca-Cola company essentially went against a century of its own marketing and advertising, its own success in making Coca-Cola something above and beyond just a soft drink. There was no reverence for the secret formula. The key thing about New Coke was it, it kind of looked very similar in terms of branding and packaging. Um, it was called New Coke, but the taste was distinctly different. I mean, they really had changed that taste, and it did taste more like Pepsi, which was noticeably so sweeter. The real disaster, I think, um, if you were going to change the taste and the formula of Coca-Cola, what were you going to do with the old Coke? And they decided to stop selling it. And that is what provoked this consumer rebellion. They paid the price for their foolishness. People were outraged that they couldn't buy the original all-American Coke anymore. Americans took to the streets to protest. Why are you upset about it? My oldest daughter is 22. Her first word was Coke. The second word was Coke. They felt betrayed. How could you change something, especially something you said was the best? You said you would never change it, and you changed it. I'm a true Coke fan. I hate the new Coke. Mm -hmm. So I'll drink Coke till the day I die. And I haven't bought any Coke since they got this new stuff out. It all goes horribly, horribly wrong. People were furious. A lot of, weren't even Coca-Cola drinkers. They were just ordinary Americans who thought something sacred had been tampered with. New Coke is now a byword for all kinds of marketing disasters. 
The great truth about both Pepsi and Coca-Cola is that it's not just about the liquid. Of course, the product is important, but those liquids represent far bigger concepts like freedom and youthfulness and rebellion and originality and tradition and all those big things. And their mistake was to not realize uh, the bigger emotional issues about changing that formula. People believe in, in the brand. And changing something like that, it's like new God. You can't do that. People get really upset. When they don't make it and then prohibit me from getting it by keeping the secret formula, then that's not American. Pepsi quickly capitalized on the backlash. New Coke is about to roll out internationally. And we at Pepsi couldn't be happier. By bringing out tongue-in-cheek adverts, Pepsi were really enjoying the demise of New Coke. In one Pepsi ad, a young girl upset about New Coke asks what were Coke thinking. Will somebody out there tell me why Coke did it? Why have they changed? First they said they were the real thing, then they said they were it. Then kablooey, they changed. Pepsi leapt onto that. They probably couldn't believe their luck. And they created a campaign that, uh, on the face of it, was uh, full of concern for these poor Coke drinkers who'd been perhaps let, let down. And they had a young lady asking, why would Coke do this? And expressing her deep sadness about this. Mm. Now I know why. PepsiCo hoped that Coke fans would abandon the drink, just like the girl in the commercial. Due to the outrage, after only three months, Coca-Cola backtracked. General Hospital will continue in a moment. And ABC News brief. The old taste of Coca-Cola is coming back. Within the next several weeks, the original taste, which many people in the country apparently missed, will be available again. It will be called Coca-Cola Classic. And the world took a deep sigh of relief. But what's remarkable to me is that the Pepsi generation actually responded well to Coke Classic, and I can't explain it. Within the year, Coke Classic was outselling Pepsi, Diet, everything was back on top. Coca-Cola learned touching the secret formula, the real thing, is dangerous. It's really dangerous. My, my favorite line about new Coke came from Don Keogh, who was the longtime Coke executive. And, he said, some people think that we didn't know what we were doing. Some people think it was actually a deliberate stroke of genius. He said, the truth is we're not that dumb, not that smart. <laughs> so what's the future for our battling brands as they embrace technology in targeting health-conscious millennials? This dispenser allows us to not only change the flavors, but it allows the trainer and the athlete to change the nutrients. I can toggle the potassium, magnesium, sodium, and carbohydrates. Over the years, a new appetite for health has emerged, and both the Coca-Cola Company and PepsiCo have had to keep on top of this growing trend. Diet Pepsi had been on the market since the 60s, but with health now being at the forefront of people's minds, Pepsi Max became their new diet leader. They understand their consumer and they respond. They have noticed the shift in consumption behavior. We want less sugar, we want less caffeine, and they're making products to suit our needs. This is a huge multi-multi-million industry in, in taking the sugar out and maintaining that flavor. So the likes of Pepsi Max, Coca-Cola Zero Sugar, I mean, these formulations, this is the, what the industry is about. It's giving people that, that similar flavor, but with less sugar, using sweetener alternatives. Coca-Cola had massive success with their diet version back in the 80s. I'm here for my 11.30 appointment. I'm here for my 11.30. 11.30. Within two years of the launch, Diet Coke had become the top low-calorie drink in the world. I don't want you to be no slave. But there's one other interesting element about that advert. It wasn't just trying to push Diet Coke, it was also trying to bring forward the consumption time of the product. And they put forward this Diet Coke break at 11am. 
And this was a way of trying to bring forward the, um, the time when people would drink soft drinks to much earlier than it actually was in practice. And it's had a remarkable success. In our new health-conscious world, the demand for consumer choice is growing. So Coke has been looking into new ways in a bid to offer an option to everyone. This is the uh, Coca-Cola Freestyle Center, where we create and innovate fountain dispensing equipment. If they're going to stay on top of their game, the solution will be found here. Typically, we don't allow filming and uh, cameras, but today's an exception. <laughs> and what will they use labs? Well, they're different. Some of them are, are magic, and I can't tell you what, what's going on in them. Come on in. The company is pumping a lot of time and effort into next-generation vending machines. We took from the medical field highly precise pumps that pump medicine and we transferred it to the beverage world. So those pumps enable us to super highly concentrate the syrups and ingredients, and we're able to add all of that choice. So for instance, in this dispenser, there are 200 uh, brand choices for the consumer. So this is the Freestyle app, and it enables me to toggle the level of ingredients. I can walk up to the machine and it recognizes me. And in my case, it would say, hi, Chris, last time you were here, here's what you had. Do you want that again? You want to try something new? Given there's 200 choices and I can mix and match those with different percentages, it's, it's limitless, really. It's all very well adding more variations of their drinks to their rosters, but with the landscape changing for consumer demands, both brands have to think bigger. The real challenge facing both Pepsi and Coca-Cola is that people just do not drink as many fizzy drinks as they used to. The peak year for consumption of fizzy drinks in America was 1998, when the average American drank an astonishing 53 gallons, which is the equivalent of 723 cans per person each year. That's fallen to the equivalent of 540 cans a year. It's an awful lot. But that is a really, really big drop if you are a manufacturer of fizzy drinks. And Pepsi have cleverly addressed this by diversifying really substantially. So PepsiCo now as a company, only a quarter of its sales come from fizzy drinks. A lot of it comes from snacks, Frito-Lay, Walker's Crisps in the UK. So Pepsi have got an eye on the future. Coke's big strategy now is that it's a total beverage company and it wants to have a presence in every soft drinks category you'll find in the supermarket. So bottled water, um, probiotics, even dairy alternatives, sports drinks. This dispenser allows us to not only change the flavors, but it allows the trainer and the athlete to change the nutrients. I can toggle the potassium, magnesium, sodium, and carbohydrates. There is one development in the wellness department that Coca-Cola are keeping quiet about, and it could be quite controversial. A story that we've been talking about, Aurora Cannabis is leading pot stocks higher today. That's because of a BNN Bloomberg report that Coca-Cola is in serious talks with Aurora to develop cannabis-infused beverages. Coca-Cola, like a lot of other big brands, are experimenting with CBD, often denying that, perhaps. CBD is a component in cannabis. THC is what kind of gives you the hallucinogenic effect of cannabis, and CBD itself is, is a actually a much healthier component of it. It's used to treat really severe epilepsies. There's some research into lung cancer. There's a wide range of conditions that CBD excitingly may have a positive impact for. There's already been some, some discussions that Coca-Cola are going to be putting CBD in some of their products. So we've gone full circle. Coca-Cola started as a medicinal product, and here we are in 2019, and they're trying to make it medicinal again using the latest one to drug cannabis. 
So, with over 130 years of ups and downs, major successes and pitiful fails, it's 2019 and Pepsi and Coke are still standing like giants. So where do our two sugar water rivals go from here? The products are going to change, the channels and media are going to change, the different sub-brands might change, but the cola wars, no doubt, are going to go on for a very long time to come. What they were very clever at is you're not just buying a fizzy drink, you're buying a brand and a whole lifestyle that comes with it. Both brands are not just selling a product, they're selling a feeling. And they will continue to market this feeling and sell it in absolute bucket loads. Some secrets won't stay buried. We're uncovering a brand new murder mystery this weekend here on Channel 5. Don't miss Agatha and the Curse of Ishtar tomorrow at 9. Next, fights camera action.